teammates and welcome to The Gold Diggers, a program where we discuss stories of leadership and motivation with sports serving as a metaphor dedicated to daily grinders, corporate athletes, and go-getters. This is Simone Haldon digging in with my co-hosts, Reddy San Agustin and Robbie Devera, and we are your resident Gold Diggers. So in our previous episode, we had a conversation with two-time World Pool champion, Rubel and Amit, who shared with us three tips on how to enter new frontiers. And her tip number one is embrace self-discovery. So Rubelin shares how getting to know herself and trying out different things and discovering what works for her has helped her on her road to becoming a world champion. And tip number two is build a strategy. Having a strategy for the long game, like approaching the game with curiosity of a beginner and simulating actual competition environment has helped Rubelin create the proper systems that made her a world champion. And tip number three is be service-oriented. With all the success she has had, Rubelin never forgets to pay it forward by supporting her family, teammates, and those in most need. And she finds motivation in knowing that by doing her best and succeeding, she would be able to give more. And now, she makes an effort to create a healthy culture that would help progress Philippine sports with a group of young athletes she mentors. So those are such great tips on how one can forge a path in new frontiers from Rubel and Amit. So speaking of new frontiers, today we're going to dig into the story of someone who has helped pave the way for women's football in the Philippines. But of course, I wouldn't be able to do this without the help of my fellow gold diggers. So Relly, Robbie, what can our teammates expect from this episode? Hi guys, welcome to another Saturday night. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of The Gold Diggers. You know, we're back again this time as we have tonight with us a football personality. Stay tuned as we will dig in with a UAP and national team legend in women's football. I'll say no more as I will pass it on to Robbie to formally introduce our special guest. Robbie, kick it off, man. Thanks, Rels. Hey, teammates, we're excited to welcome our next guest who is not just a batchmate of mine, but also one of the most accomplished football players in Philippine football. We've got another kindred individual and a fellow gold digger and certainly another one of the movers in women's sports in the country. So I'm happy we're guesting Marielle Benitez Avellana to our program and I hope you all stay tuned as we dig into her life story. Let's tell our audience more about Marielle Sim. Thanks guys. So today we have with us a multi-talented individual who wears many hats with the different roles she holds. She's a four-time UAP women's football champion and a three-time MVP two-time top scorer and UAAP Athlete of the Year. She's a former midfielder of the Philippine women's football team, a former head coach of the Philippine under-15 girls football team, a television host and a football analyst, and the current athletics director of the Philippine Women's University. And it is with, a great, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you the Miss Universe of Philippine football, Marielle Benitez Javeliana. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, what an introduction, but really um, I'm very happy to be here with you guys tonight. Um, it's such an honor to be a uh, guest here with um, on the Gold Diggers and I really just want to congratulate you guys for such an amazing podcast. So many things to learn. Um, I've listened to some of your episodes and you know it's all really easy listening. Uh, Dave and I would take it when we would go on walks and just so much lessons to learn from all your guests. So I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. Thanks, Marielle. It's nice to know that we have a teammate in you. So, you know, tell us, what have you, what have you been up to lately? Well, with the start of the pandemic, um, I would say it was a silver lining for me. I was really preparing to get back to work. Uh, I have a one year old. So at that time when the pandemic or the lockdown began, I was really preparing to get back to PWU, finish my maternity leave and get right back on to work. But um, with the lockdown, I was able to stay home 24-7 uh, with my son Lucho and also get back to work. I was lucky enough to be part of uh, Coach Nolly Ayo's group, uh, MWF Sessions, and it was really trying to get inspiration, energy from other athletes, other sports figures um, at the time of the pandemic when no one really knew what was going to happen. 
And also, luckily for me, that PWU, we continued to we continued our sports program, and we continued to do online classes. And at that time, it was really such an adjustment for for everyone. And I'm just really happy that we've been able to adjust and continue what we what we would do uh, pre pandemic. That's great, Marielle. No, so maybe just to share with our broader audience on who you are. Can we bring them up to speed on your roots in football? Can you tell us about how you how you began your amazing football career? Okay, well, I would always say that I grew up uh, being competitive and athletic. And when I was a first year student at Paria Fodros, we were very fortunate that our coaches, Coach Potin Fernandez and Ms. Emma Fernandez, began the Woodrose soccer or football varsity. And really, it was uh, an excuse for my friends and I to continue hanging out after class. And that's how I began my football journey. So I played for Woodrose. And after Woodrose, I was lucky enough to make it to Coach Hans's team to play for the De La Salle um, University foot women's team. And after my first year in La Salle, I was asked to come and try out for the women's national team. And at the time... I was about 16 or 17. Wala pang youth national team nun. So it was straight to the senior squad. And I was able to make it to the training team with a with a women's national team and continued to play on for the next 13 years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to experience the 2005 Southeast Asian Games to be captain of the, the women's team for about eight years. And I continued playing up until 2013. And then after that, when I, I tore my ACL um, in between break uh, of the AFF and the AFC, and then I took my break from the national team, but still continued to play for Gao, for the club team. And in 2016, an opportunity for me to be an assistant coach to coach Joyce Landagan for the youth under 14 came and I... Never imagined myself to be a, co- a coach, um, to coach to coach football. But I said, why not give it a try? And fortunately, it was such a great experience. We came home with a silver. And the next year, I was handed the responsibility to be the head coach for the U15. And up until this day, actually, we continue to plan um, uh, for the next youth national competitions. That's great, no? So actually, lots of successes within the football journey and even extending to the coaching journey, and also within that certain that with that time frame, you also uh, broadened your expertise in terms of like um, TV hosting as well. Can you tell us about how football got you into that bit of um, your career? Okay, well. Of course, there were games for the UAAP and they were televised. So at the time, they were looking for a football analyst. And if I'm not mistaken, I did a few games. Parang at the time, finals lang yung nati televise. And I was able to cover it with Bob Guerrero as a football analyst. But I think really the big, um, the time that it was continuous on TV was in 2010 um, when they had Balls Channel with Miss Jojo Estacio. And I think it was even Boom Gonzalez who asked my brother Marco um, that they needed a football player to be part of that show. Um, I think it was Road to Rio. So it was a primer for the FIFA World Cup. So that's how I got started. And then uh, Studio 23 or Sports in Action saw that I could be an analyst and the directors there, direct Al Neri, the other um, heads of ABS, CBN, gave an opportunity to a female uh, football player to actually call matches for the men's football team and for the Philippine Ascals. So that's how I got into um, analyzing and in commentary or hosting uh, on TV. That's great. Though. So such a broad uh, area of expertise there. So from football to playing to coaching to analytics and to commentating, it's really well-rounded. And it's so timely also that when you did it, it was during the heyday, pa, I mean like the golden days of Philippine football. I'm sure we're preparing in this pandemic for, you know, better days as well, no? But um, it will be interesting also to learn more about you because this is not the only thing you're doing. Rels, can you um, tackle this uh, thing that she's doing with uh, apart from football? 
Sure, sure. Wow. Again, amazing, amazing football career for you. I remember when you called the first your first match of the Ascals. I remember that. And you were giving you positive comments and everything. But again, uh, besides football, uh, you've taken on another passion that is very close to your heart. Uh, I'm sure some of our viewers uh, out there are not aware of this. Tell us more about your involvement with the Bayanihan Dance Company. Okay, well, Bayanihan is the national dance company of the Philippines. It, um, it's actually a 13-time World Grand Prize winner. So I take a lot of pride in being able to represent the Philippines, not just in football, but also in dance or in the arts um, as cultural ambassadors. And Bayanihan was actually founded by my grand-aunt, Helena, uh, Helena Zibanitas, and the executive director is my mom, Susie Moya Benita. So it really, she um, and my dad actually met in the Bayanihan and it was encouraged, I was encouraged to participate or to take part in Bayanihan. So when I graduated from college, I had a break from the Southeast Asian Games. I finished the UAAP. I was done with, um, with La Salle, with my studies. So I had a month off. And so my mom encouraged me to join the Sayaw workshop to experience what Bayanihan is. And so I did, um, awkward, very awkward at first, and um, eventually I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it was really the artist before I actually enjoyed the dancing. But, you know, really, ironically, you know, every athlete's dream is to actually make it to the Olympics. And I was in the Olympics in Athens 2004 as a Bayanihan performing artist with my Balintawak makeup and facade. But, you know, I was so starstruck with all the athletes, Olympians there. And there I was representing the Philippines, not as an athlete, but, but as a cultural ambassador. Wow, I'm sure not everyone knows that. But you, <laughs> you, you can actually call yourself an Olympian right there. <laughs> I mean, wow, that's, that's amazing. It's that's a, that's quite a feat, no? And uh, yeah, and you being multi-talented is really something that you know we all admire about you. And uh, yeah, so what other things are you doing? I I I I I think you you also help out with the PWU, right? You're yes. a administrator or a athletic director. Yes, I work with the Philippine Women's University as an athletic director and I handle or teach some of the physical education classes as well as some of the um, value formation classes that we have. And currently, PWU has already, or PWU during the pandemic was able to launch, launch um, a dance module in PWU wherein it actually is a 40-hour class that can be credited into a degree. So um, it's, it's very interesting because it's not really just about folk dance because I'm from Bayanihan, but it's the total, you know, it's dance, dance music, it's wellness. And anyone who is interested in pursuing dance as, as a career or even just learning more about their dance journey is very welcome to do that that module. So it has also been very interesting for me because sabi ko nga, ang background ko was really football before I got into dance. So that's um, that's what I do with PWU now. So Marielle, you're involved in the online sports leadership program. Could you tell us more about that? Okay, yeah. So during the pandemic, Coach Nolly Ayo um, opened up an online sports leadership program where all the other athletic directors would join the module to share, to learn, to share um, experiences, best practices, and really to just network and be able to bridge together or help out each other. And so I did that. I was part of the second batch. We learned from the different Olympians who guested there. Um, you had uh, Senator Freddie Webb. You had, of course, Akiko Thompson. Um, you know, these role models who share their stories, how they're able to achieve um, that Olympic level and how we can use the, the lessons and the values that they, um, they did with how they achieved their success into our programs now to be able to spread that kind of value, those life lessons to the next generation. So I definitely learned a lot. 
That's super interesting. And I mean, learning from all those different Olympians and, you know, top sports leaders in the country, I'm sure the kind of languages that you're hearing there and like learning all together as like sports direct sports directors. So interesting. So, I mean, you have a lot of activities and you have played so many roles and in football alone, you have so many notable achievements and, you know, you had a successful UAP career in La Salle and, you know, you've, you've won four championships and you've contributed to the longest championship streak a women's football team in the UAP has ever achieved. And other than that, you became Rookie of the Year and you became MVP thrice and even UAP Athlete of the Year. So that's a huge deal, especially for an athlete playing in one of the top competitions in the country. And you're like the dream teammate and the perfect rival. So tell us more about how you achieved all of that. Wow, you know, Sim, I would say that I was really very fortunate in my football path or in my football career, being surrounded by good coaches, great teammates. I think um, my success, the individual awards were just um, bonuses from the success that the team was able to achieve throughout the UAAP. And even now, you know, you look back, you don't count those those medals or those trophies. But what you really remember are the experiences that you learned and the experiences that you went through with your your teammates. So I would say I've been very fortunate with the people who I get to work with, I get to play with, and having the support from them, I think has helped me also try to achieve and try to always give my best because of the people around me. Yeah, it, I mean, of course, you know, being in a team, it's hard to really achieve all of that alone. And I love that you you emphasize that you're not counting the awards. And you remember, of course, like the highlight of your time in the UAP was your time, your experiences and learning with your teammates. So, uh, and, you know, other than that, you know, after college, you had two bands performing with the Bayanihan and training for your national team duties. How was your schedule like during that time? And how did you manage to balance doing duties for, for both? Yeah, I think, you know, anyone who hears about my schedule would always say, just hearing it, pagod na ako, or I'm already tired. Um, you know, at that time that I was doing the national, I was playing with the national team and performing for the Bayanihan. I would train with the national team, especially for a tournament. At the time, parang the whole year, the national team would be training. So three times a week, we would have training. And then it would be, let's say, six to eight in the evening. Or no, six to eight, especially when there's a tournament. So we start six to eight in the morning. And then I would go to PWU to work. After work, I would go back to Ultra or to where training would be from six to eight as well. And if there would be Bayanihan rehearsals, I would rush from training back to Manila where Bayanihan office or rehearsal hall is and try to catch up with rehearsals. So I think I've been lucky that the coaches, Coach Marlon Maro um, and the directors of Bayanihan were very understanding and they knew my commitment to both that they were also very supportive. So, so there were uh, training sessions where I would ask to leave early and then catch up to rehearsals and stay in rehearsals. Usually it would end at midnight and then wake up at five the next day to get back to the to to football training. But also um, because I knew that I was trying to balance both, I knew that I had to, to um, ask permission to really be able to prioritize. So I would do extra work. I would do um, training with, let's say, Coach Maro's team in CSB to get that extra training, which I would miss when I would leave his training, national team training early. So it was really, I think I was successful in being able to balance both because everyone understood uh, my passion for the national team, my passion for football, and my passion for performing with the Bayanihan. And I think they were just very supportive um, with that, that they allowed me to be able to, to do both. It's so important to have people who really understand why you're doing everything that you're doing. But of course, we can't also ignore the fact that you really put in the effort. And it's and of course, they've seen that, like Coach Maro and of course, your directors, because you, you really put in the time 
and make sure you do the extra work so that when you show up in training or when you perform, like, you know, you, you're, you're all there. So that's really interesting. I mean, I mean, it's hard not to understand you <laughs> and to give you support when you're actually putting in the effort, right? So um, now other than teaching in, in, in PWU and working as its athletic director, much of your time is also spent raising your baby boy, Lucho. So how is motherhood like for you so far? Yes, you know, it has been an amazing journey. Um, he just turned 14 months. So I'm really very new to this whole motherhood thing. And like what I said, you know, you can you can read a lot of books about motherhood, about parenting. But when it's there, parang you can never really prepare enough. Um, so I just take it one day at a time. I enjoy his company. He's at an age now where he tries to be independent. He's able to um, relate more. So it's a lot of fun. And I have, of course, I have a partner, Dave, who's also very supportive. Um, he also enjoys, we actually enjoy that Lucho loves being in the outdoors. So that's, um, we get to, to, share our love for for the sport for the outdoors of being active with him and we're very happy that he's he's like that but also i think um because uh i have a partner dave who has been very supportive when i have work he's very supportive with the things that i do and he knows how how much like uh the things that i've been doing before we had lucha and he continues to to what is he continues to support me to continue my passions. Um, so it has just been, you know, very, it's just been an amazing journey. And like what I said, now that Lucho is walking around and we're enjoying being active, I think it helps that he was also an athlete. Um, we seem to be calmer um, when he, he, when Lucho would, would trip or would fall. And, you know, being as athletes, parang, I know we were talking about this with, with Robina. I think as athletes, you know, all the bruises, the, the hits. Na, um, when he's okay, you know that he'll just get stronger after that, that he'll be, he'll be fine. So, um, yeah, so it, it's been fun. And like what I said, it has, this pandemic has been a silver lining. Um, being able to spend his whole uh, first year of life with him and to see the milestones has just been amazing. You know, Mariel, you have such a beautiful life. So I'm curious, what are you most grateful for? Wow, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's really the perspective of how we, we make of our life, um, you know, just trying to enjoy every day, just being passionate about life itself. But I think if you ask what I'm grateful for, I would definitely say I think I'm grateful for family. I am grateful for uh, a supportive uh, family, a supportive community or environment where I'm able to pursue my passions. Um, from way back to when I was playing a, a football with La Salle to playing football with a national team to pursuing uh, coaching um, with a youth national team. And even with the Bayanihan, being able to represent the country with the Bayanihan, um, with a so very supportive uh, performing artist, artist and director. So I think I would be grateful for that community that supports me and, of course, the opportunities that come my way. It seems that in all the different periods and roles that you've had in your life, you've had support from different people. And really, of course, to dig in more to your story and to learn more from your experience and how, and how all that support comes into play also with all the effort that you put in. Um, I'm going to have to hand you to, to RDV now so we could dig deeper into your life story. Thanks, Sim. So lots of notes being taken again from my end. Um, the overarching theme I got was uh, the word support, right? So the support that you got from your community uh, which enabled you to pursue your passions at the high level that you did as well as the effort that you put into the journey to get to where you are now i really, really appreciate that marielle and i can i can i can only imagine no so back in the day we we both used to train in ultra and then i couldn't imagine you going pa over to taft 
just to make practice and then sometimes there were practices on the on the same day you know so that's why you had to um, double time with the effort in making up for lost uh, practice hours so um you mentioned that you got into the sport and dancing also almost just for kicks and into television hosting just by chance but for me it's hard to imagine that given your long list of accomplishments that you were able to achieve you know the the success that you have already achieved so how do you manage to get to the top of your field across the many roles that you've played well you know robbie from the start like i said when i got into football it was really initially it was really just for fun um it was an excuse for my friends and i to hang out after class to continue what we are chismisan um in the football field and even with bayanihan initially i wanted to join with my best friend parang it was something that i was awkward with doing folk dance especially coming from football na very rugged very tough and then when you get into dancing folk dance especially you have to be very graceful so um initially it was really i would say i think it would just be my openness to trying out new things um and doing it with friends or enjoying it with friends um maybe that's how i got into it i would i would always say that you know it's important to try new things to learn new things every day um to invest in yourself because uh if you enjoy it then that's a bonus i mean that's something that you can continue to pers- to pursue but if you don't at least you learn something that day so i think that's how everything started and fortunately for me the things with bayanihan and football and even with um tv hosting or commentaries as a football analyst all worked out really well and these are things that i really really enjoyed it's a little um the story is not well known right on how you spent your time in in Bacolod in the national team really helping the team out uh, despite being cut from the lineup as well as this story that you had on training abroad even if it wasn't required of you so can you tell us a little bit something about that why did you have okay. to do it yes um yeah i remember i was very young that was back in 99 I think Iloilo I was about 17 years old the youngest in the national team then and it was for the AFC Women's Championships and they brought the team there with coach Maro and coach uh, Aris Kaslim and at the times I was very new to the team and then there were five girls who were to be cut in in, in that squad and unfortunately for me I was part of the five So I remember three of them went back home and the two of us stayed. So my parents were saying, "Why will you stay? Uh, uh you got caught, you won't be playing anymore." And I remember that time that coach Maro was saying, "You know, stay with the team, continue to learn with the team, continue to train with the team and support the team and see the experience." And when he said that, I was telling my parents, "You know, um yeah, maybe I'm not part of the squad playing but I feel that I was still part of the team. I continue to be part of the team and I'd want to be able to help my teammates um in the tournament the best way I can. And fortunately for me my parents understood that they saw the commitment I had for the for the national team and they let me stay. And I think that did wonders um to my football career and to to meet myself um just teaching me you know looking back i guess that taught me you know not to quit on your team um to even if you're not on the starting 11 or not even on the team but you continue to give your best you always have a place in the national national team and it will just be a matter of time for you to actually break in into the squad um and you know always i think these opportunities or experiences just wanted me just made me want to continue to get better so because i've had you know i've been very lucky or fortunate with my parents being very supportive um i'd had the opportunity to train in spain to go to bolivia to get international training stay there on my own um 
in a boarding school just to get the experience to play so that when I come back, I could actually share that experience and even increase my level of play with the national team. So, so things like that. I think um, it helps that you, you always want to get better. Um, like what I said, I didn't make it to the team in 99. 2001 was supposed to be the team that I made uh, that I would make it to my first Southeast Asian Games. And two weeks into training camp in Taipei, I break my leg. So I come back home with a broken fibula, missing out on my supposedly first uh, Southeast Asian Games. And I remember being told not to quit, um, that it's part of the sport, you get injured, and you just have to work on your therapy, never to think that that was the end of it. And so that's what I did. I worked on my therapy. I was being um, masipag. And then at the time, I was also cross-training with Taekwondo with Coach uh, Stephen Fernandez and Monsur Del Rosario in their club, OTTC. So that forced me to kick. When I was allowed to kick, that forced me to kick. And that's how I got um, my legs stronger to get back to the football pitch. And also at the time when I couldn't run, um, I think that was three months after my leg surgery, I got into underwater hockey. I had an opportunity because I had cousins who were playing. So I got into underwater hockey because I wasn't allowed to run. At least in the water, I would be able to kick with the fins and strengthen my legs. So I think, you know, you always try because you enjoy football or because you enjoy what you're doing. You always try to do things to make you better um, so that you can excel in that whatever you are passionate about. Totally agree with that, no? So the extra effort doing wonders for you and for your passion. Tell us about the man that experience you had when you had an opportunity to host. You mentioned you timed it uh, with the training course for uh, coaching license. Can you share us something a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, so um, I started hosting or I started doing football commentary, like what Riley said to call the Philippine Ascals matches and the UAP men's football matches. And I would call the game or explain the game as how I, how I knew the game as a player. So I think I saw it as an opportunity to educate the Filipino audience na alam naman natin really are basketball fans and parang didn't really have any idea about offside, what would happen in a 90 minutes, the ball would just go back and forth and walang mag-score and pwedeng matapos yung game. So I took it as an opportunity to help educate the Filipino audience about football. And for me to actually give the right terms, I remember being told by Coach Maro, Coach Aris, and even the others who, who would listen in, um, why not do a coaching course so that you can actually give the right terms and educate well or educate properly? And so that's what I did. I did the C license with the thought that it would help me in analyzing matches. And little did I know that it would actually open uh, a bigger door into coaching the youth national team. That's perfect. No, so that's we have to thank your extra effort for now, <laughs> this opportunity that um, you know, women sports hosts and women sports analysts have because you actually paved the way for like the next generation of um, uh, sports commentators and anal anal analysts on on the on the different football uh, game matches that are called live. No, so that's that's a real great step in the right direction for Philippine football and very much so for the under for the for the girls national team. No, so we have that to thank for. I totally understand going the extra mile and putting in the extra work in order to be the best in the field, literally and figuratively. So you trained extra and even while recuperating from your injury, you even trained abroad when it wasn't a requirement. So the question is, did you always have this figured out from the get-go? And how are you able to accomplish so much at the same time? Well, I don't think everything, you know, you would know all of these at the beginning. Like what I said, I enjoyed doing the things um, that I did. And because of that, uh, when you experience that little success, but they say success breeds success. So parang it builds that confidence that you want to actually continue to improve. Um, and, you know, you have the help of mentors, uh, people who have already started that pathway 
who con- who have been generous enough to also assist me in my growth. So without them, I mean, you know, you have like Sina Sinarelli was saying, I mean, these are the football guys that you would listen to who know the game when they would tell you you did a good commentary, you know, you made all these bad calls, um, and then you review or you know things like that, and and it helps that you know people appreciate the work that you put in. And you listen. But of course, there's also mga bashers. Why is a female calling a men's game? Um, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Things like that. But I think if you continue to just keep an open mind, um, you listen to what they say, and then you take in what you think would be uh, something that you can improve on with yourself. Um, they may have a point coming from their perspective, but you always just want to listen to those who you trust Um, you listen to those who have been generous enough to guide you also to succeed um, in that path. And I think um, I've been fortunate, like what I said kanina, na, I've been surrounded by a, gro- uh, a good, supportive community, whether it be in football or in the other things that I do, that you know I would trust them with criticisms, I would trust them with feedback. And I think that's the only way for us you know, to improve in anything that we do because Like you can't always come in with a mindset that you know everything, that you already know it. Parang you have to come in with a mindset of a learner and you just take in all these lessons um, to help you improve and to get that there. That's great. No? So being Amit said it in last podcast, the last podcast where uh, the key thing is to approach as a beginner all the time. No, So part of self-improvement is really getting feedback from mentors and uh, constructive um, feedback from your peers and from the community. I, I totally agree with that. I like what you said about um, investing in yourself a little early on, and it speaks a lot about having a growth mindset. So without a doubt, I'm sure you're still doing this today, no? So can you tell us how important investing in yourself is for you, especially since you have a new role now as an educator? Well, you know, they, my mom would always tell me the only way for us to really grow is to have that openness to try out new experiences. And as um, as an educator now, I actually am more conscious about my responsibility as an educator of what I pass on to the younger generation or to the, to the students, as well as to the coaches that I'm working with. At the same time, I think we should never stop learning. So, you know, graduating with a double degree in psych and marketing management, I got into PWU knowing that I need to have something in education. So that pushed me to actually take a master's degree in educational management and hopefully to also work on towards a, a PhD in education management. And, you know, so you take all these little things or modules, anything that, that you, can, you can take, Um, to to learn, and if you continue to learn, then there you are able to share more to whoever you are working with. Um, and you'll never know. Like during the pandemic, I took in bread making eight years ago. Who would have thought that the bread making would actually pay off during a pandemic? So, and you just create opportunities or options for you by learning a lot of things. Um, and then you create opportunities for yourself because you've been able to to invest in yourself. Super solid, super solid. It's all about, you know, how you create opportunities in your own pursuit of excellence. Parang there's nothing you get into that you don't want to push to the end. You know what I mean? So that's really great. I love that you're already giving back at this point. And, um, you know, Philippine sports needs all the help it can, it can get, no? And it really matters the role of educators like yourself, the role of coaches, the role of sports administrators and the NSAs play in terms of pushing the envelope of um, Philippine sports forward. So totally agree with you there and totally, I really admire you for what you're doing. So I know I know you can only do great things because of what you've achieved so far, right? Thank so, you. I don't want to keep you to myself. I'll turn you over to Relly. Rels? Totally agree with Robbie there. You know, it's you're quite an inspiration. Can't really say a tough act to follow, but I think with what you said, anything is possible if you set your mind into it. And uh, be, you know, being relentless. You know, you're coming from injury and just really 
focusing on on getting better and taking on other sports. I mean, you would have thought of that, but you know, you did. And you know, for viewers out there, this is something. This is a this is a lesson that we can learn from Marielle, right? It, and it's, and something that we can uh, use as motivation. Okay, so um, let's let's talk about um, your your uh, your playing days now, your playing career, um, especially with DLSU. You had a stellar career. Um, you pretty much uh, dominated, no? winning four four UAP titles. And in your final year, um, you achieved the perfect season. Uh, which was truly special for you. Um, you showed le leadership and no nonsense attitude. This even extended um, through your time uh, in the national team as a player, as an assistant coach, and now currently as the head coach. Um, and the success achieved with both the RP U14 and the under 15 team was something you are very proud of. So tell us, how were you able to achieve such success from each of these smiles? Well, honestly, really, back in La Salle, I like what I said, I've been fortunate to be in an environment that um, really demanded the best from every player, Coach Hans. I mean, you all know that, how passionate Coach Hans is about football. And in every game, he would demand, even if the, the teams that we would play against would be weaker than the La Salle team, he wouldn't take anything less than us scoring as much goals as he would like. So... I think having that environment, um, I think that molded me in such a way that on my senior year, on my fifth playing year, I was the last senior standing. And I would always say that the best uh, graduating gift for a UAAP athlete or for, for an athlete would actually be a UAAP championship. And for me to be able to achieve that, since I was the only graduating player at the time, I think this was back in 2003, 2004, I had to um, convince the rookies, convince the sophomores and the juniors how important that season was. I think at that time, I, was already, I already acknowledged that our experiences would never be the same and the intensity that they would give in the training will never be the same kind of intensity that I would give only because of our experiences. So... I think for me at the time to achieve that, it was very natural for me to talk to the juniors, get the juniors um, with the same goal, with the same mindset, and to explain to the rookies what the UAP was about, what um, the value of winning the championship. The year before we won the championship, so it was really having that back-to-back -back, uh, championship title. And so... I think, you know, at the start of the season, I, we set out a perfect season. That was the goal from, uh, I think, that, that, that time pa, MMGFA, Alaska Cup. Basta lahat ng tournaments na laluruan namin, kailangan champion. And it was as far as going to, you know, having dinners with each batch per team and um, getting them to understand, to understand that. So I think uh, sincere concern, sincere love, and having them believe in the same goal that I had um, helped us achieve those milestones. Um, and I think it also follows with a under-14, under-15 national team. When I joined, um, I was also coming in with the pressure that we had to win the back-to-back -back silver or get the gold the following year. And when we came into the, the camp, you know, we already had that motto, refuse to lose, um, nothing less than the gold. And it was trying to brainwash these young girls that we were off to the tournament, not just to participate, but to actually win the gold medal. Unfortunately, we lost to Thailand, but we settled with a back-to-back -back silver medal. So I think it was, it's really trying to claim, to put um, those goals and claiming it that you're actually going to achieve it and then working towards or committing yourself to achieving those things. It's great advice, you know, and, you know, talking about your, your, your time with, with, with La Salle, you know, it's really, you really left a legacy right there, um, especially with the women's team, right? And, and even up to day, up to now, you know, that the, they're still in the, the winning, that winning ways, right? The winning ways of, you know, with Coach Hans, you know, with, with, with Coach Alvin right there, you know, it, it just really set the tone, uh, which you started, set the tone for the rest, you know, for the next generation to actually continue 
and 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 stay focused on that goal and man you know re- really watching uh the women's team play is la salle wow it's really it's fantastic it's fantastic you, you like really um what do you call this um talented individuals all of that and um you know we hope we hope to see them you know with the malditas and now also with you know with the national team you know um you started off as an assistant coach right with 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 coach joyce so how 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 influential were you with with uh during your time there i mean it was your first time it was your first time to coach right i mean yes. coach mara said oh, join uh, coach joyce for that how was that well actually it was um It was an overwhelming experience considering that it was only coach Joyce who had experience as a coach and she took us in as her assistant coach me Bella Fernando and Patrice Impelido all rookie coaches and she took us in and I think what helped was our experience that we all played together in the national team so I think that helped the teamwork um that allowed us to to enjoy coaching um to work well together and you know after i i gave myself six months for that team and after the six months i was telling coach maro and coach aris na coach i don't think parang we can continue because i was very um you know i was very set na i never really imagined myself coaching more so coaching a national youth team and they were saying you know it's very special for us coaches to come home with a medal especially on a rookie coaching um exp- career so he they were saying that maybe there is something with with that group and um i think there is because we enjoy coaching together and the following year um i was head coach but my assistant coach was coach joyce so parang nagpalitan lang kami so i think it's that mindset that we respected each other um even if we did not agree whoever was the head coach at the time we would support um so that's i think that's how that's how we were able to achieve um our success in the in the U, U14 and that continued on even in the next tournament where we were were uh we were kolelat in palembang you know starting off with a new age group but i think you're able to share your passion with the coaches and then with the youth players um to continue playing like i was telling sina robian sim that i would always say my success as a coach is not winning the u14 but my success i would say as a coach is if i'm able to see these youth players make it to the senior squad and then you know that you did something right when they were under under you as players and we hope that you will continue <laughs> to 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 coach um these these young kids no because i think given your credentials what the career you that you've had you know you you serve as an inspiration to these kids and you're a testament that you know all the hard work that's needed is and your knowledge right and experience is something that that will you know motivate them to actually again move to the malditas uh, the first time okay um let's talk about now your current role as uh as a PWU um, administrator and athletic director of that. Um, you continue to engage in sporting activities and programs for the students of the university, even getting involved with the dance academy for the school, which I'd like to believe that you pretty much are very hands-on right now, <laughs> given that you know, dancing and fine arts is also, folk dancing is, is your passion. So how challenging is this for you at the moment? Well, you know, pre-pandemic, it was challenging enough trying to get uh, get the school to believe in the values of sports. I mean, it's a different uh, it's different when you're working with the student athletes, but to actually get the PW community to believe in the values of sports and the the good that sports can bring to to the students or even to the community. So, parang initially that was the challenge, but luckily, I think through time. Um, we're able to show that through the different uh, sports jams, different uh, intramurals, different PE activities that really promote futsal or sports in general. And even with the student athletes, you know, of course you want championship titles for the school because it brings glory or honor to the school. But really, um, in totality, 
what you want are programs or um, yeah programs that will actually develop the students or the student athletes as well-rounded individuals. Um, you know the the goal really is to create programs and coaches who believe in student athletes succeeding in their academics, succeeding in their sport, and then graduating with a degree and then excelling in whatever they will do um, once they get into the real world or, or when they're working. So I think it also goes um, hand in hand with, you know, being part now and hands on with the dance academy. Um, I, I experienced the, the lessons, the, you know, the things that I've been through, through dance and, and sports. And it's just something that you want to be able to share. So with the Dance Academy, my role actually is to help um, run the program. The module was created by PW Campus Life, by my mom, Susie Benitez. And so we're helping her because sports development office is under Campus Life. We're helping her run that program. And I teach the, the preparation part whether it's uh, visualization, mental preparation, physical preparation of a dancer um, with the experience as an athlete and a dancer that I'm able to share and put together. So um, it, it's a good program. It's for anyone who, like what we said, anyone who wants to just learn um, something new, something different, or someone who wants to continue their dance journey. Um, that that's the dance academy, but really, as an athletic director, really, you know, you have the responsibility um, to to mold these student athletes and get them to succeed, not just in sports, but also in school and then eventually in life. I like it. I, I like the whole vision you have for for the school, you know, and of course, student first, athlete second. I think that's 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 very mo that's most important to everyone and. Uh, yeah, and given your experience and how you know you're you're using it now to 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 influence you know these students to to be like you, yeah, in a way, or or to be to be better. But so we wish you all the luck for this one. Um, that's that, that that ends my my round of questions. I will now turn you back to Sim. So we've learned so much from your life story, and if you were to summarize, what can we learn from your experience on how to set yourself up for success? Uh, coming from your own experience? Well, you know, Sim, like with what we discussed, you know, there are three things that I would say help me succeed in what I, um, I've been passionate about. And it is really to surround yourself with a community that is very supportive. Um, second is to be able to invest in yourself. Always, I mean, for you to be able to grow, always be open to new experiences. And, you know, never, never try to discourage yourself if you did not succeed. So always invest, always keep an open mind to learn new things every day. And lastly, of course, have that, um, have that mindset of um, setting goals, trying to achieve um, goals. Because like what we were saying, success breeds success. When you're able to set those goals and you're able to achieve those goals, it gives you that confidence to actually achieve bigger goals. And hopefully, um, if you continue to work hard, you continue to be passionate about the things that you do, you will actually achieve those goals. Solid. Very well said. And there you have it, Mario's top three tips on how to set yourself up for success. So number one, be surrounded by supportive people. Number two, invest in yourself. And number three, set goals for yourself. So thank you very much, Mariel, for sharing your experience and lessons with us. So now it's time for our next segment that we call Crunch Time. And all right, Mariel, we're going to throw you some questions and you're going to have to answer them as fast as you can. So there's no need to explain unless we can't help but ask. So are you ready? Ready. <laughs> all right. First question, football or dancing? Football. Playing or coaching? Playing. Coach Hans or Coach Maro? That's tough. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> Choose one. Choose one. Choose one. Um, you wow. Are. You know, I was asked that before. Can I explain? Yeah. <laughs> I was asked that before, but, you know, with Coach Hans, 
um, it was actually a, a an eye opening. Uh, it was culture shock for me coming from Pare Fodros, um, getting into the La Salle program, waking up at 5 a.m., doing 10 kilometer road runs. Like what I said, we started off just enjoying football as an excuse to hang out with friends. And then when I got into La Salle, um, that's when I saw uh, with Coach Hans, that's when I saw um, the seriousness of the sport. You know, having to put in the hard work, the the diff, the you know the difficulty. Um, to be able to succeed in the sport. But at the same time, with Coach Maro, I think he was the one who gave me that opportunity to play in the national team at 17. Um, it was a senior squad, and he saw that potential in me. So it's a little bit difficult to choose one because I think both really created that pathway for me to be where I am right now. Excellent non-answer, no? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Coach Hans and Coach Mara are good friends of ours. So, uh, shout out to Coach Hans and Coach Mara. Uh, so, number four, favorite football icon? Mia Ham. Nice. Mm -hmm. Most memorable sports experience? I would say for football, it would be my sophomore year. Golden goal. Last two minutes before a penalty shootout, goalkeeper Elio Deliara was injured, and then I scored the golden goal. That's great. Um, Who's other a golden game? goal? Nun? Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> other sport you could excel in other than football? Other sport? I think I'm a frustrated basketball player. I think I'd like to play basketball athlete you admire the most? Oh, that's it. Local or just... I would say my brother, Marco Benitez. <laughs> Good answer. Yes. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite sports film? Coach Carter. End goals or process goals? Process goals. All right, for the non-sports questions, hobbies in life apart from sports and dance? Right now, learning how to cook. Nice. Um, favorite yeah. non-sports non film? My best friend's wedding. <laughs> favorite color? Orange. Wow. Favorite food, if that's even possible? Yeah, that's that would be another tough one. <laughs> Comfort food, maybe spaghetti. Okay. Sleeping or exercising? I'd like to think exercising. Favorite book. Right now I'm reading the champ how champions think. Life purpose in three words. Um, <laughs> live life to the fullest. No, that's more than three words. <laughs> that's good. That's great. That's fine. Alternative career. Alternative career. I'm not so sure. Um, I think I would have dabbed into anything from dancing to playing sports to hosting to teaching i she's I'm done pretty so much sure. everything guys yeah, pretty much everything already <laughs> <laughs> there must be something else well, if, you could, if you could have a superpower what would it be speed i love that answer <laughs> you know everyone else me to mariela's given like high polluting answers <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I would like to choose speed. It will help you. Um, well, one, I have uh, as a player, I think I lack speed. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's something that I would, would want to have just to be able to achieve more or do more. But you've achieved so much already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sure, you know, there's there's... Uh, a whole other, I mean, so many more things that I can try, experience, um, you know, just to continue learning and enjoy. Enjoy. I agree. 
Okay. Um, what legacy would you want? Uh, would you want to leave your son, Lucho? Okay. Um, I was reading this book um, about about life, and it really struck me that the three things that um, I could leave as a legacy, or three things that I could actually give my family, would be, or the three greatest things that I could give my family would be time time to be able to spend with them, to, to laugh, to enjoy, um, just to be with them. And because time will be the vehicle to actually create memories. And then second, this me um, would be memories. Memories wherein um, they'd be able, I'd be able to share um, with them stories that, um, you know, like even in the pandemic, you realize um, memories are the ones that hold us close when there is distance with family members. So that's something that I want Lucho to, to know. And lastly would be tradition, because tradition would be something that um, will live on longer than, than our lives. So it's the stories told um, in the dining table, the, the stories told um, in the things that you do the traditions that you do that would carry on and that would be the one that they'll be able to carry with your memory in it. So definitely time, memories, and tradition. Perfect. So, all right, crunch time is done. We can't go beyond that because that was such a beautiful answer. So thank you, Muriel, for being game to join us today and for answering our questions. And now we've come to the end of the episode for our final messages. So Relly and Robbie, let's share with our teammates what we have in store for them in our next episodes. So there you have it, folks. On behalf of the Gold Diggers, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight, especially Marielle, for, for being our guest. Please do share your thoughts with us on Facebook pay, on our Facebook page and tag the Gold Diggers PH. Or you can post or comment on our video uploads on Facebook and YouTube. We'd really love to hear from you guys. Thank you also to everyone who has followed us on our Facebook page and subscribed to our YouTube page. If you haven't liked or followed us, we hope you can click that button and continue to dig, with, dig in with us. Tune in next week as we dig in with the president of the Kurom Group, the organization that handles some of the top sports retail brands like Toby Sports, Runner, and Urban Athletics. And this man is Toby Claudio. Got any questions for Toby? Hit us up on our Facebook page. See you guys. Robbie? Thanks, Relly. So, Marielle, your story is one of um, passion and the pursuit of excellence. And we thank you so much for the time, the wisdom, and the experience that you shared with us and to the rest of our listeners. So thanks to people like you, there's a lot we can learn from sports and especially in setting up our own paths to success. So maraming, maraming salamat. Teammates, once again, we're happy to share that we began our Gold Diggers Mental Health Minute in partnership with Rock Ed Philippines this year. So join us and our fellow Gold Digger, Gang Badoy Kapati, on Thursdays here on the Gold Diggers for quick mental health first aid tips for you to get your reps on. So once again, to our teammates in Rock Ed Philippines, thank you so much for what you do. Lastly, once again, let's continue our fundraising with our advocacy pitch in PH. And... Please follow our Facebook page for more details on how you too can learn how to pitch in for PH. So finally, over to the woman of the hour, Marielle Benitez Avellana, your final message for this episode, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Simone, Robbie, Rally. You know, it has really been an honor for me to be a guest here on The Gold Diggers. I had such an amazing time sharing my story um, with you guys and with everyone else listening. And again, I want to congratulate you guys for such... Uh, a wonderful platform for the athletes or sports leaders to share their stories and for the listeners to actually learn from, from the stories that are being shared. And there's just so many that um, you can really pick up from the, the podcast that you guys have been doing from your first season to the second one. And I know you guys um, will have so many more uh, high-performing athletes, so many more projects. So congratulations on that. And Maybe to end, I would like to thank all those um, who have been very supportive of my path or my career, um, from my family to all the coaches, mentors, teammates, um, everyone, even in PWU, because I wouldn't be where I am right now if it hadn't been for their support, for their mentorship, um, 
for 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 all of those uh, generous people who've helped me um, carve my own path. And I think it's important that every individual or each one of us really try to continue to 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 grow, to self actualize, um, to to continue to do things that we are passionate about, or to find whatever we are passionate about, and to really pursue excellence in doing. Anything and everything, um, be it in sports, be it in the arts, or whatever um, we are passionate about, to just continue to do and give our best in everything. So, thanks again, and of course, I want to thank Dave um, for letting me do the episode, taking care of Lucho <laughs> um, tonight. So, again, thank you and congratulations. And that ends our session for today. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Marielle Benitez Hamdaliana on how to set yourself up for success. So catch you on the next episode of The Gold Diggers. And remember to dream, dig in, and win. Take care and see you. <laughs>